Yes, you're perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Come on, tell him. Because you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked. Beside me, winter storms may wait for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my. All over my life, all over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak. Yes, God. Fear may come, but fear will leave. Yes. You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength, and you Lord. All over my life, yeah, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment. All over my life, all over my life. Come on. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. Oh, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over. All over my life, yeah. I see the evidence of your goodness. All over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment. All over my life, all over my life. So why should I? Yeah. 
every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain.
break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. The longer that I've walked with God and realized who He is, the more I realized who I am. And if we're going to be an army that rises up and rises up strong and takes territory from the enemy and doesn't give him ground in our lives, we have to be strong. Amen. And so we have to know who God is. We have to have moments like this where we remind ourselves of who he is and the power that he has and the authority that we have being his child so that we can be an army that rises up. Amen. Father God, I thank you that you have given us your authority to walk in. Father, I thank you that you are close to us and you are constantly reminding us of who you are and what you died for us to be. Father God, I pray that a revelation of that would rise up in our souls, Lord God, so that we would be a strong army, that we would not give ground to the enemy and that we would fight in battle for our friends, for our family, and for the lost and dying world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I hope you feel encouraged today that you feel stronger after being in this moment. Well, I'm excited for a powerful message. Pastor Matt's going to tell you that a lot of things shifted, that God is moving, and he has a powerful word today. But take the next minute. We have some announcements for you, and we'll be right back. great week. I just have a few announcements for you today. The first is if you're new to Life Church X, then we would love to get to know you more. So we'd love for you to fill out a red card that you can find in the seat back in front of you. Just fill it out with any information that you feel comfortable giving and then put it in an offering box in the back of the sanctuary. If you're new online, then you can just give us a hand wave emoji in the comments and one of our amazing leaders will get with you and get some more information from you. Second, if you already call Life Church X your home, this is your opportunity to give. We have multiple ways that we can give. You can give by um, filling out a envelope that's on the seat back in front of you and putting it in one of our offering boxes. You can also give by mailing a check to 400 Park Street, Waterloo, Illinois, 62298. You can give through our mobile app or on our website at lifechurchx.com, or you can give by texting the amount to 84321. The last announcement that I have for you today is that we are starting life groups for our fall session. If you'd love to dig deeper into God's word and get to know more people and community, then we would love for you to sign up for a life group. You can sign up by going to our mobile app. You can sign up by going to our websites, or you can find a QR code somewhere around the building and sign up. All right. Are you guys ready to hear an awesome word today? All right. Well, good morning once again, everybody. 
welcome. It's beautiful to see all of you. You know, you look beautiful out there. Did you know that? Just you guys' faces, you just, I was just kidding around in the earlier service, but I was, I was, I was really true. Like, we're just a good looking church. I mean, it's not a prerequisite to be here, but come on, look around, you know? Look at your neighbors, say, you look beautiful today. You see, look at the person, am I, am I right or am I right? Right? Yeah, that's a big round of applause. I want to just welcome all of our online campus visitors today as well. We're so glad that you're with us. You know, I can't see your face right now, but I know that you're beautiful on the other end of that camera right there. In fact, if you'd be so bold, why don't you put a profile pic of yourself up there so we can see your pretty face this morning right now. No faking, no posing. It's got to be you. It's not your head on a movie star's body or anything like that. Oh, man, I'm excited, and we're having a good time today. The Lord's really been moving here uh, this weekend, and as many of you know, we're kind of right in the middle of a message series right now that I'm loving. The series is Church Myths. We're breaking down various myths that kind of common misconceptions people have about church, their relationship to church. And helping people understand how many of these misconceptions can be a barrier that erodes our healthy relationship with the body of Christ that God calls us to. And so we're breaking those things down, helping people establish some healthy foundation. Uh, But today, this week is supposed to be week three, and we're actually going to kind of put a placeholder in this series right now and come back to this next week. And here's why we're going to do that. So last night, whenever we were at our Jerseyville campus and went up after worship and announcements and all that, getting ready to preach the message that I had all my notes prepared for, um, for part three of Church Myths, Jared, and as I was just talking and welcoming everyone, kind of exhorting people, the Lord just dropped something in my spirit right there in the moment and just kind of traveled down that path for a few minutes and I felt like, man, you know what, this is what God is wanting to say tonight. And so that was the message that that I preached last night and left yesterday evening. Pastor Guy asked me, so are you going to do that again tomorrow? What are you going to do? And I'm like, honestly, I really don't know. You know, I don't know. Um, But I prayed a lot about it last night, meditated on it. And then again, early this morning when I got up and still wasn't entirely sure But as I was meditating on it, I felt like the Lord was really just preaching this message and opening it up to me more and more here this morning and last night, even from what it was when I preached it. I began to see, one, how this was a really major message for me. Um, I felt like I was really preaching it to myself. And then God began to teach me and show me some of the things that I preached that he was teaching me. I was like, wow, that was good preaching, you know, okay. Uh, Just kidding, no. Um, But he was teaching me like more about what he said last night and then he began to show me some more implications of that message for the church right now i believe for life church x for body of christ and just what god's doing in this moment okay and so i felt like okay well you know i'm gonna have to preach that message tomorrow and so i resisted the urge katie was like whatever you do just like don't, you know, wake up and start putting all your notes together and trying to put your outline together and do all that. Because that takes me days to do, you know. She's like, you're just going to be a mess if you try to do that. So I'm here just with my Bible today. And uh, now I appreciate the applause, but I'll be back with notes next week. So, you know, don't boo me next week when I get my iPad out. But, um, but yeah, I just, I, I want to bring this message to you raw and pure and just as, as much of what God's downloaded to me here um, since last night as I can. And here's what I want to say. I heard the Lord last night, it just kind of the way it was coming to me was that God is ready to do major construction in collapsed time frames in the body of Christ. He, he is preparing to do major construction in collapsed time frames, all right? And then that's what he began to open up more and more to me as the night went on last night. And I remember one of the things before I got into vocational ministry on the, my business background that I was a part of, our family has a business, my dad runs a construction company, and I used to run a lot of projects there 
and we would come into these new job sites and you know they'd excavate the site and the grading would be done and it just looked like kind of a torn up piece of earth but you could kind of picture it in your mind what it was going to look like you had the blueprints and so we'd go in and we were typically on a timeline of when we were to complete the project and every subcontractor had their own deadline and you know the goal was to try to finish ahead of schedule and the bigger the project the longer the timeline some of these projects could take months to complete you know major strip malls stuff like that and it was always exciting when you knew you were ahead of schedule so if you had a six month project that you completed in five and a half months it was a huge deal I mean, that's a huge deal, right? Um, a four-week project that you completed two or three days early, that's a pretty big deal. Of course, weather, different factors could push you behind schedule too, and always strive to be ahead of schedule. But even in a six-month project, five and a half months, considered a huge deal in that industry, you know, we hear that and think, oh, that's, you know, two weeks earlier. This is what I feel like Lord's up to right now. I, I, I feel like, you know, who knows, but exactly when the time or hour is, nobody does, but the, the time has to be getting closer to when Jesus is coming back, has to be getting closer, because when you see and study the Bible, what you find is the signs of the end, one of the things is that there is a collapsing of time frames, there's a collapsing of time frames between several things, one of those would be like cataclysmic events, tornadoes, tsunamis, hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires, you know, all these things we're seeing in our world today, toward the end, those things condense. They're, they're more frequent, and they're on a much larger magnitudes in the destruction that they bring. The Bible says that the earth is groaning like with labor pains, right? Labor pains. How many women have had kids know this? The contractions get closer together, and they get more intense, all of you husbands know evidence by the scars on your arm from being in the, <laughs> in the hospital room, right? They get more intense. And so the Bible says that the earth is like that towards the end. And so we see this collapsing of time frames. But also we see that the church, God's people, the body of Christ, there is a major uprising there as well prior to the rapture and, and return of Jesus. We see the church getting stronger. And I feel like the Lord is saying to the church that he's prepared to do major construction in collapsed time frames. So that six-month project that was done early at five and a half months, I, I'm just throwing this out there. Well, imagine if you went out there, they started the project, and then three days later it was done. I mean, that's just insane, right? That's, that's supernatural kind of thing. Like, what happened? That's miraculous. I believe that's the kind of work that the Lord wants to do. Certainly, I believe it's what he wants to do in the final days with the body of Christ, but I believe he's saying that he's prepared to do that now. Like, now's the time where he's ready to do major construction in condensed time frames. Let me just say this. I look at Pastor Guy today, and I look at Kelly up here, and it's just remarkable to me when I think about this. We just ordained him into pastoral ministry two months ago, three months ago. Yeah, July, wasn't it? June, so four, three, four months ago. And I'm just sitting here, I'm thinking about this message, and I'm looking at him, and I'm looking at Kelly up here. By the way, where did that power come from today? Yeah. Holy cow. I mean, who are you, and what'd you do with Kelly? You know, that was amazing. Um, I can just hear our online audience right now throwing up the hands raised emojis and everything. Woo, go Kelly! But I'm looking at them, and I'm seeing Pastor Guy, and I'm thinking, I would not know that I'm looking at a guy who has only been ordained into pastoral ministry for four months. I mean, he looks like a guy who's been walking in a pastoral ministry calling for years. That's the kind of work that I'm talking about that God is ready to do right now in the lives of his people. Are you with me? And I want to be prepared for that. I want to be a part of that. I want to be one of those laborers that's a part of that supernatural completion deadline project that's going on. Do you want to be a part of that? You know, God is prepared. He's looking for willing vessels. He's looking for people who can be used to be a part of this process. And I think the context of the message today a lot has to do with what we as sons and daughters, members of the body of Christ, things we need to be aware of and be thinking about in order to be prepared to be a part of that kind of work that's getting ready to happen. 
Uh, I mean, I hear church statistics reports all the time, constantly getting surveys and things like that on what is forecasted for the future. And here's what I would consider to be um, initially an alarming statistic, but I think that there's something really positive that will come from it, okay? Um, Just my opinion. But predicted over the next 12 months that massive numbers of churches will be closing their doors just due to all the things that are going on. However, it's also forecasted that, that we will see more church mergers and churches joining together than we've ever seen before. And I just think to myself, what an opportunity for a display of unity and what an opportunity for some churches that may be unhealthy internally right now to join with healthy churches and then become healthy and the body of Christ gets stronger and more effective in our communities that we're in. And that, I mean, that's, that's what I think about. And so I think when we see, consider, well, how would God do major construction like that? Well, there's a whole lot of ways. Most of them I couldn't even begin to think of right now. But I know God can do that. And we can look around at the landscape two, three, five years from now and think, my God, he just did in three or five years what in some some eras it took 50 or 100 years to accomplish. Are you with me? And so what do we need to do? What is God saying as far as us as people um, in the body of Christ to, to be prepared for? And here's what I want to ask you today. If God's ready to do major work in your life and around you, are you movable? That's the question. Or maybe I'll say it like this. How movable are you? Because oftentimes the major construction, the major work that God is doing, those huge God-sized opportunities, they are on the other side of us being able to be disrupted, being able to be shaken out of our normal, orderly kind of way of life, our organized agenda, if you will. And so I began to think more about this, and it's true more now than ever before that our lives are so crammed full, are they not? I mean, so much of it has to do with just our technology and our connection 24-7 to everything, and I'm not even sure that we were created to absorb this much information in this short a period of time. I'm not sure that we were, and we're, yet we're taking it all in. And what we're doing is we're filling our lives with this stuff. I mean, how, let me ask, how much free space, open space, do you really have in your life? When you read a book, don't you appreciate the fact that there are margins on the side and at the top and at the bottom and that there are breaks in between paragraphs. Can you imagine if the entire page was filled with words from top left to the bottom right corner? Could you read that? I couldn't read that. But those margins, that space on the page just really allows it to flow with a rhythm and a cadence. Do we really have margins in our life? Is there really space in our life nowadays for God to move and reposition us and shift us around the way that he really wants to. We, we sometimes become so locked in and dialed in and, let me say, locked down to our agenda and to our schedule, it's very, very hard to move us. It's very hard to shift us. And there's very little space for, for God to work his way in to do something unforeseen because everything else is already accounted for. Everything else is already taken. I, I think a lot, and I get concerned about our younger generation and even my kids. You know, they're growing up, and they, I mean, they don't know another way, right? This is kind of what they're growing up with and what they're seeing. Lives being so scheduled and so planned out and so full all the time. I mean, I feel like as parents, Katie and I are trying to rebel against culture <laughs> with this thing. I really do. Like, we're trying hard to push back and say, we don't want that for our kids. We want them to know what it's like to have space in their life, to have God-interrupted moments, to hear the voice of God, to just sit and be and let God show up and not be in some kind of a rush to get out of there. I don't want my kids growing up with a completely planned out, mapped out, fully scheduled every moment of everyday life that they're locked into and there's no room for disruption. Are you with me? So I, I've titled the message this, this morning because they were asking me, well, what's the title, you know? And I didn't have one, of course, because I didn't have the message. <laughs> but So I got the title this morning, Disruption, is what I'm calling it, Disruption. 
Oh, there you go. It's on the screen. Good job. So um, how disruptible are we, really, if we get down to it? Are we able to be moved? Are we able to be shifted? Are we able to let go of all of our agenda and crammed life in order to make space for unforeseen God-sized opportunities to show up, and then we are able to actually seize them when they do, instead of being so distracted with a full life of things that we miss those moments. Can we get there? Because I believe we need to be able to get there. I believe that we need to be able to be a people, especially right now, perhaps one of the most important skills that we as mature believers need to hone. And I, I use the word skill hesitantly, but I can't think of a better word to describe this. But a better skill that we need to hone right now than being able to keenly discern the voice of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Did you know we are people who are created to be led? We're never meant to lead ourselves, right? It, a, the Lord orders a man's steps. So how can a man know his own way? We try to take our own steps and go our own way. That's when the Bible refers to we go down a crooked path. But praise God, we serve one who makes the crooked path straight. And when we walk in the steps that he's ordered for us, guess what? We walk that path that he's created for us. And it's no longer crooked anymore. But we've got to be able to be led, which means we must be able to be keen and discerning and understanding and tuning into the voice of God and the gentle promptings of God throughout our daily lives. And I'll just say this, it's very difficult to do when there's so much noise that you can't hear it. And a crowded life creates that. Ecclesiastes says, better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls chasing after the wind. Simply put, an overcrowded life is not going to bring you more happiness. You need space in your life for the things of God to be able to be birthed in the seasons that He wants to birth them. And get an amen on that one, right? We need that space in our life. And so we've got to be able to be moved in order to head down that direction that God is trying to take us. And if He's really ready to do major construction in short amounts of time, and He's saying, I need people who are movable, are we in a place in our lives where we can let go of the agendas and the schedules and the overcrowding in, an, in enough way where we can follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's often referred to as a gentle whisper or a still small voice. In fact, vast majority of the time that I can recall, probably 99% of the time, where I feel like I hear God speak to me. It's, it's like that. Still small voice, gentle whisper. And you can't hear that if you're far away and if there's a lot of noise in between you. Am I right? Somebody in the very back, if AJ was whispering to me right now, one, I need to be focused in on him to see that he's trying to get my attention. I need to be close to him to hear it, and I need to have a lot of noise level brought down around me. But then when I hear it, I can understand and discern what it is he's trying to say. And that's how the voice of God moves in our life. It speaks to us that way. And we've got to know when there's so much noise around us that he may be trying to speak and we, we're not even picking it out. We're not even dialing into it because there's so much going on around. There's no margin anywhere for that to get on the page. And so we're going to look at a story today where I believe is a great lesson, a great example of what it looks like when someone can be easily moved, when someone can be easily disrupted. So we're going to go to the book of Acts chapter 8. If you have your Bible, go there. We're going to talk a little bit about a man named Philip today. Philip's an awesome dude. Um, not a whole lot in scripture about him. We see earlier in the book of Acts that he was one of several disciples that were picked to help serve some of the elderly and the widows along with Stephen and take care of some of the major things going on in the New Testament church. And then we see this story in Acts 8 that we're going to read today, which is uh, fairly lengthy compared to the other verses about him. Later in Acts, we see kind of toward the later part of his life that Philip is referred to as Philip the Evangelist, 
which is awesome. I think you'll see why we call him that when we read this story here today. Uh, and then it also says, one of my just favorite things that I pull out of Scripture, it says that he had four daughters who prophesied. So he raised up four daughters who moved in the gift of prophecy, which, let me just tell you, that speaks a lot of the character, the integrity, and spiritual maturity, and the leadership of the man as well. And so, um, let's go ahead and dive in, and we'll move along and unpack this today. Chapter 8 of Acts, verse 26. So an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. This is desert. Let's just stop right there and keep the verse up. So Jerusalem is where Philip is. This is the happening city. Like, it's the place where it's going down. All the festivals, people come from all kinds of places to come to Jerusalem when the festivals are occurring, major population of people. I mean, if you're thinking in terms of like opportunities, you think, man, this is the place to be, is Jerusalem. That's where Philip is. But the voice of the angel of the Lord says to go away from Jerusalem and go down to Gaza, down a desert road that is approximately 60 miles long. Could have taken a couple of days' journey. But the thing that jumps out at me, it's kind of like this obvious, like, whoa, which may or may not jump out to you, is this last little statement here. This is desert. Do you, do you think that? Think about that. Like, what he's saying is, I want you to leave the place where everything appears to be happening and I want you to go to a place, listen, that's dead, dry, barren, and lifeless. Now, in the natural, that probably doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. It might even be in a moment like that where we have a little conversation with God that has something along the lines of like 20 questions and a few reminders to God about maybe he got his wires crossed here. <laughs> Wait, Lord. <laughs> oh, you no, know, Lord, I want you to use me. You know, I'm ready and I want to do some things for you. I mean, you, you must have spoke wrong or I must have, you know, something isn't right. We're, I'm in Jerusalem already and you're telling me to go where there's no life and it's dead and it's barren. But what I've found and believe what this story shows us is that many, many times those God-sized opportunities are on the other side of a simple command that can come to us in very unsuspecting ways. And I think in a lot of cases, the Lord's probably just saying, I want this to require faith from you. I, I don't want it to be easy for you to see in the natural how it's possible. I want you to see through the eyes of faith how it's impossible in the natural, but it's possible with me. I think that, you know, I think that's the road that I'm going to take you down to go step into this God-sized opportunity. Now, I'm going to be really frank with you and just open, and I, I wish that most of the moments in my life looked like this here with Philip. But many times, I, I'm the one that, you know, hears it and asks 20 questions. Now, well, you know, what about this, and what about that, and well, I mean, what if this happens, and what if that happens, and I, I'm not so sure, I need to kind of, you know, wait on that one a little bit. And I'm not saying there aren't times for that. You understand that, right? Just like I'm saying that planning and having an agenda isn't wrong. It's just when we get locked down to that, that we can't be moved. That's when it becomes a detriment. But what I'm saying here is that there are times when the Lord needs to move us, and He needs to move us now. And, and waiting and tearing around in this valley of 20 questions can a lot of times be an impediment to the progress of the kingdom being advanced through our lives as a servant of God. I just wonder how many times the Lord's like, enough with the questions, would you just start walking? Would you just get on the road? I, I was pretty clear, Gaza, you're in Jerusalem, desert road, go! <laughs> and, and we're like, yeah, but... 
come on. Anybody honest out there like, yeah, but. You know what they say about but? No, never mind. I'm not going to go there today. All right. Yeah, but. So the next verse in verse 27, the next sentence, I love. It says it all right here. So he arose and went. We got to look for sometimes what's not in between the sentences. And what's not in between the sentences here is that Philip requested a download of the full blueprint and the full map and agenda and every step that needed to be ordered out. He went on a command to go walk on a desert road away from Jerusalem. That's all he got. That was it. And he started stepping. You see, that simple obedience, that quick obedience to the leading and the commanding and the promptings of the Holy Spirit, I have found increases our sensitivity and discernment for future occasions. I've heard it said, and I love this statement, that delayed obedience is no different than disobedience. Right? We've got to be quick to obey. We've got to be keen to discern and quick to move. And that's what I see from Philip right here. And the fact that he did that put him in position for the God-sized opportunity that's getting ready to happen. And we're going to read into that and we're going to see what happens. But listen, I want to just encourage you with this. Philip had no idea and he couldn't see. But God saw every moment of it. In fact, let me blow your mind a little bit more. He didn't only see it. He had already been there. Because he's the God of the future and he's the God of the past and he created time and he's outside of it and he's not bound by it. And so I can't even put my head around that, but he's already been there. He's already been in your future too. And he already knows what he has planned and what awaits you. And he's beckoning you. He's, he's drawing you to walk down these roads that you can't see everything that's out in front of you. Will you trust him? Because it's a walk of faith, not a walk of sight. And that's what Philip does. So we continue on. Here's what we see. Continuing in verse 27. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. So Philip gets moving down this desert road and he finally comes to a point where he probably sees some dust and he sees some things going on on this desert road and behold, it's a chariot with a, an Ethiopian eunuch that's traveling down the same path. Now this isn't just some ordinary Ethiopian speaking by like cultural standards. This guy is pretty high society. Because he has charge of the queen's treasury. He's watching after the treasure, the loot, the goods. Very important job, very important responsibility. His life is pretty well on the line every moment that he's traveling. Because if one thing go, goes wrong with that treasure, there's not going to be any questions asked. He's just done. right? And so his life is on the line. Certainly the last thing he would normally do would be to stop and quit doing what he's doing or to interrupt his trip when he's trying to get this treasure back where it belongs so he can breathe again and sleep at night because he's completed his mission. But he's also a man who likely has a very influential voice and place in a lot of high society types of people back in Ethiopia as well. He's probably got a lot of connections and a lot of influence. Listen, in an area and a region that's really totally unreached for the gospel at this point, back in Ethiopia. And he just happens to be traveling down this desert road. I, I try to peer through the eyes of Philip a little bit in this moment. And i got to believe if I'm Philip, when I get there and I see this, Ethiopian man, eunuch, influential guy, on a chariot. I mean, this just can't be any ordinary chariot, Right? I mean, it's got to have some bling-bling, I'm sure, going on. Probably gold plated, got spinners on the wheels, you know, tricked out sound system. The whole deal. Leather seats, heated seats. No, they don't need that in the desert. Never mind. Air conditioning. 
I mean, he's got to see, like, okay, this dude is highly influential. And of all things that the guy can be doing, he's reading the book of the prophet Isaiah. If I'm peering through the eyes of Philip, i got to believe at this moment, I'm probably starting to go, okay, God, okay, I see, I get it. Starting to make more sense now. Now this whole opportunity, never would have guessed that this kind of guy would have been in this kind of place at this kind of moment when I started walking, but now I see it. Not sure exactly what's going to happen, but I see how something is setting up, like a perfect wave that's getting ready to position for a surfer. It's, it's getting ready to set. And I think that as we follow the Lord in those simple commands, and we take a few steps, that we begin to get more and more clarity every step of the way. It's like God dispatches little assignments and words to us in increments to see, well, will you go here? Never mind out there. Will you just go there? Because if you'll go there, then I, I think you have enough faith to go the rest of the way. But if you won't even take the first step, what makes you think you got enough faith to go the rest of the way? And he dispatches like this in increments. But I think now at this point, if I'm, feel, I'm probably getting pretty excited. Because now I see, okay, God's got something planned here. He's got something going on. But so many times, even if we feel like we're hearing the voice of God, the leading of the Holy Spirit, so many times we're just kind of afraid to step out there. What if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? And we get, try to get a bunch of contingency plans in place and things in order and a plan B. Let me tell you something. You want to live a life following God? Forget about a plan B. There is no plan B. It's plan A, number one, all the way, and that's it. It's all about His plan and no other plan. If we try to put a bunch of contingencies in place, that just becomes a distraction. And we get afraid to step out. We think, well, what if I'm wrong? What if this isn't what I'm supposed to do? Let me say something that I want you to just hear, and I know I need to hear, and let's just deal with it, okay? We'll never do it perfectly. Okay, can we just deal with that? Can we just be okay with that? We will never do it perfectly. Are you going to step out sometimes and maybe you missed a detail or maybe you didn't hear perfectly? Yeah, it's going to happen. But here's what I found. If your heart is pure and right and your motives are to serve God and bring Him glory, He can cover that. He can work with that. I mean, even the apostles, Paul himself said, well, we tried to go to Bithynia, you know, and then it was like we messed that, we missed that, God, the Holy Spirit wouldn't let us do that. So then we tried to go to Felicia, and, you know, then the Holy Spirit wouldn't let us do that. We missed that moment, and we were wrong there. And, but, but then we tried to go to Macedonia, and then the Lord opened the door. I, what I see is they weren't perfect, but they tried because they had the right motives. God covered that, and he just redirected them. Thank God for redirecting. How many people use GPS to get places? Okay, on there online, how many people? Come on. How many people don't go, can't go anywhere beyond 10 miles without GPS? Okay, so we argue in the car, my wife, because I say like she's got a closer relationship with Siri than she does with me when we're in the car, you know? It's like she, you, you can't, if Siri's not pointing out the map, you know, we're not going to be able to get there. And I'm the good old-fashioned intuition, you know, because we guys, we always know how to get places with directions and stuff. So, um, so funny thing happens whenever, you know, I tell her where, which way she needs to go, and then she doesn't listen to me, and then she makes a wrong turn. Right? It happens a lot. And so when she does that, GPS has this remarkable capability. It's called rerouting. You right? It's just like all of a sudden it, it just charts a path from where you are to get back to where you need to be and then just continue on your destination. God is the master rerouter. Can I just say, Romans 8, he, he can turn all things together for your good. He can cover our moments even when we step out there and we're not perfectly discerning what needs to happen. But if we don't take those risks and those steps of faith, we're never going to hone that skill, that ability to grow more sensitive to keenly discern those gentle promptings and divine impulses that are the leading of the Holy Spirit along the way. And so Philip gets there and he sees this 
And he's in this moment where this guy's reading the book of Isaiah. In verse 29, we continue, and it says, The Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And so he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in Scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. I mean centuries-old prophecy about the Messiah who had just come. I mean, of all the places this guy can be reading, of all of the questions that he could be asking, he's saying, tell me who this is. Is that unbelievable? I I think sometimes we don't give God enough credit. And we think the obstacles... And the difficulties of our friends, family, peers, people around us, they won't listen. They're not going to hear me. They're not ready for that. I think sometimes we don't give God enough credit for the obstacles that stand in our way being able to be removed. I mean, this guy's on a desert road in the middle of nowhere reading the Bible about the Messiah of all places asking, who is this guy? Can I just tell you this? God is so very interested and able in getting the gospel into the places where people want to and are ready to hear it. He is so able to overcome those obstacles. And we need to have faith for that. Let me say it another way. God is so interested in getting rivers of living water that we carry to move and flow into dead, dry, barren places where there's seemingly no life right now. And it's all over our world. There's plenty of dry, desert, barren wilderness around us in our communities where seemingly no life is flowing and God is ready to move His people there. He's ready to position his people to bring that source of life and water into those places that are dry and parched and ready to just soak it up when it gets there. He's reading the prophet Isaiah says, can you tell me who this is about? Verse 34, so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning in this scripture, preached Jesus to him. I mean, that is the gospel. That is Philip the evangelist right there. Do you see that? Preached Jesus to him. Let me think sometimes, I mean, I don't know enough scripture, you know, I don't know enough Bible verses, I don't think I've been in church long enough, and I haven't been through membership class, I'm not sure if I'm ready for the big game, you know. Better bring Pastor Matt, better bring Pastor Guy, I'm not sure. I'm kidding around, but you know what I'm saying. Like, sometimes we think we're just unqualified. Dude, preach Jesus to him. You saved? You know Jesus? You got a testimony. There's the gospel right there, how it invaded your life and changed it. How you were dead and now you're alive. And Jesus is the reason. He preached Jesus to him. What happens after he does that? So they went down the desert road, and he came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Evidently, those words were pretty effective. Whatever Philip said, and I'm I'm guessing it was fairly simplistic, it's about Jesus, the gospel, whatever he said was evidently very effective. I just want to remind you, encourage you, that our Bible tells us, the Gospel of Luke tells us, even when men, women stand before kings, high authority figures, you need not worry about what you're going to say. And you definitely don't need to be intimidated, stressed out, or have anxiety. Because the Holy Spirit himself will put the very words in your mouth that the occasion requires at the given time. 
You ready to share Jesus with somebody? He'll give you the words. Not saying you're going to have the most eloquent words. Very few men in Scripture did. But he'll give you the right words at the right time if you're a willing vessel and you're in position. Amen? He says, uh, any reason why I can't get baptized? He evidently heard the words. He evidently received the message because he's asking, can I get baptized? Yeah, yeah, well, well, whew, well uh, that was a good question. Um, let me think about that. Uh, well, we haven't been through membership class. We're going to have to get back there and do that first. Um, well, we're going to have to go through four or five steps. No. Let's, let's, let's get on with this. Let's see this guy's life changed. He's ready to receive Jesus. And he says, is there any reason I can't just get baptized right here? Now, can I ask a stupid question? Where did the water come from? I mean, it's a desert. Not exactly. In fact, I think if you read the definition of desert, it says no water. We're not talking about a few drops dripping off of a plant here. We're not even talking about a little bitty babbling brook. He's got to get in. He's got to get submerged and immersed in order to get baptized. It's got to be a river or a big stream in the middle of a desert. What am I trying to say? I'm just trying to say that God can provide abundantly every resource, every provision that's necessary to accomplish His will and purposes in the lives of His people. You need a river? Yeah, no problem. Easy. Boom. I parted one. So here, I'll throw one out there. You need a river? No big deal. You need an opportunity? I got this man that needs me, and he needs me now, and I'm so glad you didn't wait around in Jerusalem with 20 questions for two days before you left, because we're here, and the opportunity is now. Let's get on with this thing. Let's see this guy in heaven, and let's get him in that water and get him baptized. You need a river? No problem. We'll put it there. I think the most difficult thing of all, really, it was Philip's ability to be moved, because God wasn't going to overwhelm his will to accomplish that. They can put the river out there. He can do anything anywhere. But he's wanting to use people to accomplish things on earth that he wills in heaven. And so our ability to be moved, our ability to keenly discern and then quickly obey and walk in faith to follow it through, that's really the variable here. And Philip passed the test. And because of that, this guy's life has changed forever. We can debate and argue and have all kinds of theories about, well, this matters, this matters. You know, if if I don't do this, then I won't leave a legacy here or whatever. Let me just tell you something. The fact that this guy in heaven is what it's all about right here. This is the most important thing that could be happening right now is that this guy goes from death to life. And Philip gets to be a part of that. Not so long ago, Philip was hanging out in a busy place and got gently prompted to move to a desert land. I seriously doubt while he was there, he was suffering from boredom. He probably wasn't sitting around twiddling his thumbs and just thinking, watching the clock, boy, I wish the Lord would just use me to do something. Just wish he would do something for hours and days. He was probably very busy with activities in a busy city. I don't know that any of us in the room today can say we suffer from boredom anymore. There's so much going on, just pick what you want to do and how much of it you want to do and how little of sleep you want to get because there's enough to go around for everybody. But because Philip's plans and his agenda and everything that was there was able to be disrupted and, and discontinued for something else that God was leading him into. And it was very unsuspecting, uncommon. He would have normally probably never picked for himself. That was the reason why this thing unfolds. I mean, I just wonder how many desert roads right now God is ready to move you on away from the crowded, over-busy schedule that you've got planned out for the rest of the year. And everything that you're ready to fill it with. I'm not saying don't have plans and agendas. I'm just saying leave margin and leave space and be 
good at discerning the voice and promptings of God and be ready to move that direction when the Lord leads you. I love the fact that Philip could just put a pin in it, whatever he had going on, pause, pin, maybe it'll never happen after I leave, I don't know, but God's over here, he ain't over here anymore, so I'm going where he's leading, I don't care if it's a desert road or not, I'm going where he wants me to go, and I'm getting away from what I think it needs to look like, can we, I'm probably, uh, that's good stuff, all right, Pastor Man, can we put a pin in things, can we scratch it if God wants us to? I think if we can, guys, I do. I think if we can, and we grow in this, discern more and more keenly where we can pick out the voice and gentle prompting of God in the middle of whatever else. Oh, wait a minute. God's, God's saying something. Oh, wait a minute. God's, God's telling us to stop here. Let's hold up. That kind of sensitivity, then we can really, as Paul says, walk in the Spirit every day, and be led toward those God-sized moments and opportunities that he has planned for us. I, I want to close with this last part of the story. I think this just wraps it up perfectly. Verse 37, Philip said, well, yeah, of course, if you believe with all your heart, then you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So Philip was basically saying to the eunuch, well, if you're serious, if you mean what you're saying, yeah, absolutely. And the eunuch was like, well, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I mean, I get to be a part of some really awesome moments in people's lives and see so many things, and I love digging into the scriptures and studying the Hebrew and the Greek and all that different stuff, but I just got to tell you, I don't know that there are sweeter words to my soul than when I hear people for the first time say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I remember on an occasion a few years ago, I had a majorly busy day going on. Have you ever had those days where it's like from the very first part of the morning that you wake up, Back to back every hour on the hour, you got meetings scheduled and you're cramming phone calls in between and then you got errands to run that really don't fit on the schedule, but you're still going to try to get those done in between there too. And then at the very end of the day, you get home, your head hits the pillow and you're just like, Whew. right? You ever had those kind of days? I was having one of those kind of days. It was a few years ago. And there was a lady who reached out to me. I don't even think she was going to our church at the time, but she was aware of our church. She reached out to me. And said, hey, my, my daughter's in trouble. I just feel like you need to talk to her, you know? I'm not going to say every single thing that comes at me I do, because I don't. I can't, you know? But I just felt like the Lord said, you need to scratch your plans. And you need to go do this. So this girl was in a bad way, and she was in a place where she was trying to get help. And it was way out in, like, way past like St. Charles or Florissant, Missouri, all that kind of stuff. And so I just, I drove, you know. And on the way there, I just felt like the Lord kept saying, this girl's going to get saved. This girl's going to get saved tonight. I've never met her before in my life. So I get there. Mom's there, takes me in, her dad is there, you know, and they're just a wreck. They don't know what to do. It's kind of a major crisis that happened. And so I get there and meet this girl, and we just talk for a few minutes, you know. And about 10 minutes into it, I just said, I just shared, I just preached Jesus to her. I just shared the gospel with her. I can't tell you it was like some real eloquent, great delivery. I mean, I just told her about Jesus, you know. And I just asked her, do you, do you want Jesus in your life? And she just started crying. She said, yeah. I just let her in a prayer right there. Simple thing anybody could do. Let her in a prayer. Give her heart to Jesus. And she did. She got saved that night. You know, she still comes to this church almost every single week. She's bringing her kids to church here. She comes with her friends. She comes with her mom. And there's a transformation that has happened in her life. This guy says, I believe Jesus is Lord. 
Those are such sweet words to hear. And people are perishing if God can't get his children in position to share the good news with them. And then this awesome moment happens after this guy gets saved. After he commanded the chariot to stand still. Don't you love that? The eunuch. Okay. Time out. Stop the chariot. Never mind the treasure. Something bigger is happening right now in my life. And I don't care if I die because of it. Because I'm getting ready to live. And he goes in the water. He's baptized. And he comes out. Listen to this. Verse 39, when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and then went on his way rejoicing. Hey, modern day language for this, Philip was teleported. True story, teleported. That's what God did. He can do that. Pretty awesome. But the eunuch never saw him again. This was what, maybe hours, who knows? Not some huge, lifelong situation. This was really a tiny assignment in the scope of things. But of such eternal significance. Thank God Philip was able to be moved. Thank God he was able to be disrupted. And they never saw each other again. But it says the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Oh, how that ministers to me today. Because what he's rejoicing about has nothing to do with Philip. It has everything to do with the Jesus that he just met. He's got a reason now to sing for the rest of his life. And I can only imagine the men and the women in his family, his friends, his circle of influence that he went back and shared what happened to him with and totally disrupted their lives as well. They probably never even saw coming what came back from that desert road on the way to Gaza to Ethiopia. He's rejoicing because he's got something to rejoice about in his soul that's greater than anything this world could offer him. He's probably singing for the rest of his days and he's up there in that heavenly choir right now and we'll get to meet him one day when we get there. But what I love about this is that it was never really about Philip to begin with. Yeah, we learn from Philip. Yeah, we draw a lot of lessons out of his obedience and his faithfulness. But at the end of this thing, evidenced by the eunuch rejoicing as he went on his way, even though Philip's gone forever, it was never about Philip to begin with. It was always, always, always about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. It'll always be about Jesus. Let me tell you something. You are not the hero of your story. I know the world wants you to think that. I know this may not sound popular, but I'm just telling you, you are not the hero of your story. Jesus is the hero of everybody's story. He's the hero of your story. He's the hero of my story. And unless he's the center and the hero of the story, then it's never going to become all that it's supposed to be. But when we can let go of our plans and say, it's not about my will, but it's about yours, God. Use me, guide me, lead me, and help me to do what you want me to do. It's all about making you famous when our heart is really in that place. Oh, how usable we are. And oh, how mighty the works of God that we will witness as we move forward with Him. Let's stand to our feet today. Let's worship the King. Come on, the prodigals come home, help us find hope, love is on the moon, when the father's in the room, there's no swing wide, the dead come to life, love is on the moon, when the father's in the room, lift it up, miracles take place, cynical find faith, love is breaking through, when the father's Walls quaking, strongholds now shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Lay your burdens down Ooh. here in the Father's house. Check the chain at the door.
Hallelujah. Well, before we go today, I just want to ask you a question that I asked you in the beginning. How movable are you? How movable are you? And as you go, I encourage you, I appeal to you, endeavor to be more keenly discerning to the gentle promptings, the divine impulses of the still small voice that must guide our lives. And as you do, I believe that we will say in the days ahead, I saw a lot of God-sized opportunities take place on many a desert road. I believe with all my heart God is ready to do some major construction in the body of Christ right now in short, collapsed time frames. Things that might have taken years to develop will happen in seemingly what's moments. And that the body of Christ will get stronger, more influential, more effective, and more and more people will call upon the name of the Lord. I want to ask you today, if you're here, or you're watching online right now, wherever you're at, and you say, Pastor, I, I don't know if I have ever truly given my life to Jesus. You know, maybe you've heard the story since you were a kid, been through all of the steps and processes, but at the end of the day, if you can't really truly answer this question with certainty, would I be in heaven if I died right now, then something needs to be settled in your soul. Because Jesus offers us that blessed assurance that we can know we are sealed by the Holy Spirit and heaven bound whenever we've given our lives to Him. You say, I want that assurance. I want that certain hope today, Pastor. I want to lead you in a prayer. It's just a simple prayer, but it's about the meaning of your heart behind it. And God will meet you right where you are. And He will make you a new creation. You will be what the Bible describes as born again. Before Jesus enters our life, we are all dead spiritually. But He brings life to us. And we are born again. Heaven bound for all of eternity. Maybe you're in another scenario, you say, I've walked away from the Lord, I knew Jesus, I walked with Jesus, but I've went away from Him, and it's been a long and messed up road, and if I'm honest, it's a lot of damage and wreckage in the way, and when I look back behind me, I, I, I can't even really see the way back. I want to get back there, I just don't know how. If that's you, but your heart says, I want to walk with Jesus, I want to get back to living my life close with Him again. Please hear me. He is not asking you to move all of the debris out of your way yourself to make your way back to Him. He is the loving Father that meets the prodigal son. And when the son says, I'm ready to come home, the father opens his arms and he runs to the son right where he is. He's not asking you to earn your way back. He's ready to meet you right where you are if your heart is to come back to Him. If either of those situations describe you, I just want to encourage you to pray this prayer. Cry out to God in your heart. Mean business with Him. And He will change your life forever. This is your day. This is your moment. And this is not catching God by surprise. In fact, dare I say that He had this appointment prepared for you before you ever even knew it. You say, Dear Father God, I give my life to you today. I announce that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He suffered and died on a cross. He shed His blood so that I could be saved. He was buried in a tomb. And after three days, He rose again. He conquered death. And He did that so that I could conquer death as well. I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm ready to give my life to Him. I turn away from the world and the life that I've lived, and I turn entirely to You, Jesus. 
And just picture yourself turning like 180 degrees away from the world, all the distractions and pleasures of the world that divide for your attention, your energy and your heart, turn entirely away from them, 180 degrees, turn entirely to Jesus and put both hands on him. And now let him lead you the rest of the way. Father, in Jesus' name, fill them with your spirit, God, now. Fill them full to the point of overflow. I pray, God, that you would just speak to them, lead them, and guide them. Help them to develop keen sensitivity, to discern your voice in all matters and seasons of life. Help them to become the person, God, that you've created them to be. The game changer in our world that I know you want to use them for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, has this helped anybody today? Are you encouraged? Right? Disruption. Am I movable? Desert roads await us, major construction, collapsed time frames. Father, I pray that you would bless each and every one of them as they go. Be with them. May your countenance rest upon them. The joy of the Lord be their strength. May your peace that surpasses understanding guard their hearts and minds. God, move us. Help us to become movable. Open our eyes to the things that we need to see. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a beautiful day. We love you. And you do not have to be in a hurry to get out. Encourage each other. Love on one another as you go.